So I'm Amy Savage, and I'm here today to talk to you about the history and science of low-carb and ketogenic nutrition. A little bit about me. I'm board certified in internal, integrative, and obesity medicine. Um, and as Lisa mentioned, I have a concierge practice in Pasadena. And I'm a ski fanatic, if anyone else likes skiing. So the goal of this talk is really to lay um, a foundation for some of the later talks today. Um, we'll first go through the history of low carbohydrate and ketogenic nutrition. We'll talk about what it is relative to the standard American diet, what ketosis is, and we're going to talk about some of the basic mechanisms and science behind how and why low carb and ketogenic nutrition can be used for various conditions. And we're going to, at the very end, touch on my systems based approach to health. So, for the history of low carb nutrition, um, my goal really is to share the kind of long and varied history. Um, it's not a fad diet that's been around for only five or ten years. This is a nutritional plan that's had efficacy in many areas. Uh, starting in the 1800s, we have, can you hear me okay? We have William Banting. So William Banting was an undertaker who was very successful. He buried the kings and queens of England. Um, but he struggled with what he called resistant weight. He had an extra 50 pounds that he couldn't lose. He spoke to his acquaintance, who was an ENT, Dr. William Harvey. And Dr. Harvey started him on a low-carb diet. It worked so well for him that he then published the letter on corpulence. And this letter on corpulence was so popular that he had to republish it four separate times. A few years later, we have a famous German doctor, Dr. Wilhelm Epstein, and he is well known for a condition called the Epstein anomaly. But he too suggested low carbohydrate and ketogenic nutrition in the treatment of obesity. And then moving to the Americas, we see out of John Hopkins University, Dr. William Osler, who uses what is essentially a ketogenic diet in the treatment of diabetes. In the 1920s, we move into ketogenic nutrition as a treatment for epilepsy. So starting in 1921, there's a prominent doctor who presents at the American Medical Association. And he finds in his research that fasting can be used to treat epilepsy. We then isolate ketone bodies. And a doctor out of Mayo Clinic, Dr. Wilder, finds that with these ketone bodies, as long as they're present, seizures could be decreased, and he called this a ketogenic diet. Also in the 20s, we have this amazing explorer, anthropologist out of Harvard, finder of new lands, uh, Willemer Stefansson, and he spends years living with the Inuit people. The Inuit people are what was considered the Eskimo people before, and they ate a diet that looked was largely consistent with a ketogenic diet, mainly most of the calories coming from fat. And so when he came back to the Americas, he decided that this actually worked really well, and he promoted this type of plan. In fact, the Journal of the American Medical Association published an article uh, about kind of this style of eating called The Effects of an Exclusive Long-Continued Meat Diet. In the 60s, we have my favorite one, the drinking man's diet. <laughs> in 1972, we see Dr. Atkins' diet revolution. And then in the 90s, we see a resurgence of interest in the ketogenic diet. Um, there was a little boy named Charlie Abrams, and he had intractable seizures, um, and his family was desperate. He was on the medications he was supposed to be on, and nothing seemed to work for him. So they took him to the Mayo Clinic, where he was put on a ketogenic plan. And his seizures remarkably improved. And the family was so amazed at this plan that could work so well, they decided that the world needed to know about this. They stumbled upon it. But it was something very important. So the father, Jim Abrams, goes on to NBC Dateline and he shares the story. And then he makes a document or a film with uh, Meryl Streep that he produces called First Do No Harm. 
And then we see them setting up a foundation that to this day is still around called the Charlie Foundation, really trying to spread the word of ketogenic nutrition. In 2007, we see investigative journalist Gary Tobbs really turning the food pyramid on its head with his book, Good Calories, Bad Calories. And then, of course, in 2010, our favorite, Dr. Eric Westman and Finney and Bullock, uh, writing The New Atkins for a New You. So for the history, what I hope you were able to kind of glean from those slides was really we have a long history of successful treatment in various conditions. I'm going to spend a moment differentiating the standard American low-carb and ketogenic nutrition for those people that are not as familiar um, with ketogenic nutrition. So the standard American diet, we see most of our calories coming from carbohydrates, around 60%, and very little coming from fat. As we move into low carb, we're cutting back those carbohydrates significantly. And we see more of our calories coming from fat. And then again, as we move into ketogenic nutrition, most of our calories are coming from fat, and very few are coming from carbohydrates. So what's the problem with the standard American diet? Well, we know that in the body, sugars and processed starches quickly raise blood glucose levels. So if we look at the blood glucose roller coaster, we see our processed starch and we get a blood glucose spike. Well, the body doesn't like having a lot of blood glucose circulating around so that it releases insulin, a large bolus. And what often happens is it overcorrects and we end up getting kind of this big glucose dip often below the level at which it started. And with that, we can feel fatigue, brain fog, and sugar cravings. So we decide to have a sandwich again. And we get a big spike in our blood glucose. Sadly, we again get that huge bolus of insulin. And the cycle continues. Over the long run, we end up having high glucose and high insulin levels that are prolonged. And the long-term effects of this is weight gain, insulin resistance, and inflammation. And we'll talk about this a little bit later. So for those of you that don't know uh, what ketosis is, it's basically the breakdown of fats into fuel. It's the fats that come from our food and the fats that come from our body that are turned into long-chain fatty acids and in the liver converted into ketones, such as beta-hydroxybutyrate. When we think about nutritional ketosis, it's usually a level of 0.5 micromolar. So that's how many ketones that we're measuring. So nutrition is medicine. What type of nutrition do you think can lower inflammation, improve metabolism, decrease seizures, decrease migraines, and pain perception? while improving depression, insulin resistance, and type 2 diabetes? Well, you're here at my talk, so <laughs> I'll try to answer this over the next few slides when we go through the science behind low-carb and ketogenic nutrition. So how does low-carb and ketogenic nutrition work for weight loss? Well, we talked about that blood glucose roller coaster. When we stop having so many processed sugars and starches, our blood glucose levels maintain a stable level, which means we don't get quite as much insulin release. We don't have these high levels of insulin. And when we don't have these high levels of insulin, we get a reduction in the amount of fat being created. And with lower insulin levels, we can start to break down our fats as fuel. If we go into ketosis, we can get some direct appetite suppression from the ketone bodies themselves. We get increased CCK production, and CCK is a gut hormone that helps you to feel satiated. And we also get lower levels of ghrelin, which is a hunger hormone.